Miracy. Hundreds of years ago, no one had a choice about their religion. You were born into it and you lived it. And that was it. That, there was no such thing as conversion. I mean, that was really rare. But now we have this opportunity to be no religion, to be spiritual, to be kind of whatever you want to be. And I think that that's really good for human consciousness. Hello, and welcome to Consciousness Explored, where we delve into the human experience and consciousness. I'm your host, Melissa Deal. In each episode, we'll dive deep into ways to expand our consciousness and the impact that our understanding of consciousness has on every aspect of our lives. On today's episode, we have Reverend Dr. Katie Valentine. Katie is a spiritual strategist with a deep love for assisting entrepreneurs and leaders on their Christo expansive journeys. She is the founder of Soul Forge Coaching, where she empowers people to unlock their potential through spiritual practices creating a ripple effect on planet Earth. She holds credentials as a shamanic practitioner and Reiki master, complemented by a PhD in the New Testament and ministerial training. Katie is the co-creator of the enchanting CD, Harp Solo and Chakra Grounding Meditation. And she's no stranger to podcasting either. You can find her deconstructing religion on the Heretic Happy Hour, taking people on cool journeys in the Magical Mystical Journeys podcast, and finding the intersection of business and spirituality on Soul Savvy Business, right here on Mira CFM. We'll be right back with Katie's story. I grew up in the Deep South, and it's going to be just not shocking to anyone in North America that that's a very, very religious place. So I grew up in a spiritual system where I was really surrounded by a lot of evangelical culture, a lot of kind of Southern Baptist culture. And I also attended a Catholic school growing up. And then I went to a Protestant church that was kind of in the middle of all of those. And I inherited kind of every spiritual trauma that was available and, and also every spiritual diversity and spiritual blessing that could be found in all of that too. My parents were raised Southern Baptist and they absolutely knew that they did not want to raise a Southern Baptist. They found it a little too restrictive or a lot too restrictive and didn't like the exclusion of who's going to heaven or who's going to hell. So we were all raised as mild-mannered Methodist and we were super nice and super boring. You stand up and sing your hymn, you sit down, you listen to the sermon. But it, it imprinted on me, I think, a, a really deep love for the teachings of Jesus. I saw those very clearly. I saw the power of people to do good, to really feed the hungry, to clothe the poor. That inspired me. I certainly saw that in the nuns who taught me at the Catholic school that I went to. They took the vows of poverty in order to better the world around them, and that left a deep imprint on me. I told my mom when I was little I wanted to grow up and be a nun, and she said, no, honey, we're not Catholic. You can't grow up and be a nun. And uh, I, I was right in some senses that I grew up to do a spiritual calling. That just wasn't it. So I was deeply involved in re religious institutions, youth programs, all of that kind of thing when I was growing up. And then I went to college and studied it some more. I went to a small United Methodist college and it was smaller than my high school. So we're talking about a very, very small liberal arts college. But it made a very safe place for me to explore some big ideas. There was a good religion department. It had two or three professors in it at the time. So we got a lot of individual attention. And at that time, that's when I was really able to solidify what I thought and wrestle with ideas about things like sexual orientation, which was the topic of the late 90s. I was there in the late 90s. I graduated in 2000. And so I, I was really given a safe space to explore all of that, to meet people who were different than me and to be challenged on some of my ideas. I was always good at school and felt compelled to keep on learning and learning more about my first love, which is the Bible. So I did something crazy and I went and got a master's in New Testament. And you may think, what can you do with a master's in New Testament? Let me tell you, not a lot, not a lot. There's not a lot of job openings for people with a master's in the New Testament. But during this master's program, I learned Greek, I learned some Hebrew, I learned what I really loved, which was about origins of the Bible, what its impact is now, and how we deal with that, both the shadow and the light side of the Bible in our culture today. And that has stuck with me, and I liked it enough to continue on and to move to Berkeley, California, where I pursued a PhD in biblical studies. In Berkeley, 
there's just this beautiful way to be spiritual in the world. And Berkeley is the place to learn about meditation and intuition and chakras. And so I did that on the side. So by day, I was studying ancient languages and in a, in a very rigorous program for my PhD. And at the same time, I was really learning to lean into my intuition, maybe for the first time. A few years into her PhD studies in Berkeley, Katie had what she calls the year from hell. Nothing was going right. From her academic program to personal relationships, Katie was depleted and decided to do something to feed her own soul. She'd always wanted to learn to play the harp, so she did. Her teacher turned out to be part of a pagan community, which was perfect for Katie's blossoming awareness and continued curiosity. Katie found that learning to play the harp was beneficial for both her academic progress and her personal life. She completed her PhD, got married, and began working on her ordination as a Christian minister. But being put in a box was not Katie's style. I was continuing to explore all of this metaphysical stuff. And I started applying for jobs to teach in small liberal arts universities and I was getting interviews and I was getting some attention, but I wasn't getting hired by any of them. And finally, I, you know, I looked at my husband and said, this is silly for me to look for these positions to move around the country, or around the world for jobs that aren't going to pay very well. And I said, let me pursue my own business where we can be very mobile and where I can do something that I really like and that really has an impact. So I started coaching Christians on how to be metaphysical in their journey and haven't looked back. And that's emerged now into also working with entrepreneurs on all sorts of different spiritual paths and helping them deepen their spiritual awareness, facilitating space for people to know that they have spiritual allies everywhere, seen and unseen, that can assist them as they seek to make their own impact in the world. We're back with Reverend Dr. Katie Valentine. That's really terrific, Katie. I I love your eclectic religious upbringing and and how that informs the work that you do now. It's so helpful, especially for those who maybe didn't have so much openness and opportunity to explore religion and spirituality the way you did. So I'd like to talk more about that. But first, can you tell us how you define, explain, or understand consciousness? This is such an interesting question. I understand consciousness as the state of being awake and aware, or perhaps the state of awakening and increasing our awareness. And I see that both as me as an individual, like who I am, but also who I am in relationship to the world around me, to community, that consciousness is is in fact collective. And that when one person grows in consciousness, we have the opportunity to bring others along with us if they want to come along on that ride. Well, I find the evolution of consciousness, since you were just talking about that, to to be very experiential. Like, I don't think awareness is something that anyone can grasp through just reading or hearing about it. There have to be moments of personal experience that accompany that growth. How do you feel about that? And do you have any examples of your own to share? I do agree. And uh, one example, it seems so trite, but it seems also really relevant. And then maybe a, a bigger cosmic example after that. And so, you know, our personal moments of growth often happen when we're very embarrassed or we're in pain or both. But this is just such a little example. One day, just sitting in the living room with my husband and he was leaving the room and I was just kind of on the couch and he just absentmindedly turned off the light switch. And I said, hey, wait a minute, I'm in here. He said, oh, sorry. And I think I just ripped him and gave him a little hard time about it. I wasn't truly angry, but he said, you do that to me all the time. Oh, wow. And he said, you enter rooms and exit rooms as if I'm not in them, like turning lights on and off and just for like forgetting to leave the thing out that I need. And he was completely right. It was this moment of opportunity for me to grow in my consciousness that I am in my own interior head all the time, obviously, because it's me. But I was in there so much that sometimes I really was just not respecting the people around me. And it wasn't out of malice at all. It wasn't like I was doing something on purpose, but I wasn't being as conscious as I could be about the people around me. But another example that's maybe a little bigger cosmic example actually does come from the Bible. And it's a story that absolutely everyone, even if you're not a fan of the Bible, is going to be familiar with. And it's the story of the Garden of Eden. So we have the two people in the garden who are without clothes and don't seem to be aware of the fact that they are naked in the world. 
And then they eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they become aware, they become awake. So this is, to me, not a story of sin or consciousness of sin. It's a story about human consciousness and waking up. And we see that the first man and the first woman wake up when they eat the knowledge of good and evil. And I don't see that as a bad thing at all. This is not a story about a fall. It's a story about waking up. And I remember the first time I read that interpretation by the late, great Marcus Borg in a book that he wrote called Reading the Bible Again for the First Time. And I thought, dear Lord, this is what the story is about. This is such a better interpretation than it being about the downfall of humanity. It's about the growing up of humanity. Like that story encapsulates a lot to me about what it means to be aware. The man and the woman aren't at fault for not being aware, but once they bite the fruit, they can't turn back at all. And so the, the innocence and childlike phase of life is all fine. That's great. That's, that's something we, we value, but we can't stay there. So our collective consciousness means that we constantly have to find the next tree and the next fruit to eat. Um, and it was also a moment of personal awareness for me when I read that interpretation and thought, how could I have never seen that before? I'd been so conditioned to see the story in so many other ways. Right, right. So as a Christian minister and New Testament scholar, how do you feel that Christianity has impacted the evolution of our collective consciousness? There, There's so much light and shadow here. So I'll, I'll start with the shadow because it's, it's just so obvious, I think, for anyone kind of alive in the Western world who has any degree of consciousness, that, that a huge part of Christianity, past and present, has really worked to reduce consciousness to one narrow viewpoint. And unfortunately, Christianity has this horrific history of calling anyone outside of kind of this narrow orthodox viewpoint a heretic and doing fairly horrific things to them. And so this is, I think we could see a lot of these acts are not probably religious motivated. A lot of them were politically motivated or motivated by people who wanted power and didn't really care about the spirituality or religiousness of it all. But they certainly were acting in the name of their religion. And so this, this shadow side is hard to deal with, and it's so hard to deal with that it's caused many people to depart from Christianity, and I can totally understand why. But I think on the flip side, there's, there's two things there. And one is that these acts of horror have actually catapulted us into an age of not being complacent with religion or with spirituality anymore. People now have choices. Hundreds of years ago, no one had a choice about their religion. You were born into it. And you lived it. And that was it. That, there was no such thing as conversion. I mean, that was really rare. But now we have this opportunity to be no religion, to be spiritual, to be kind of whatever you want to be. And I think that that's really good for human consciousness. So it's not that I think the shadow side of Christianity has happened on purpose so that we can have this collective experience. But I do think that this shadow side has prompted humans um, in the Western world to start looking more carefully at our spiritual choices. And that does have an impact on collective consciousness. I think the second thing with looking perhaps at the, the lighter side of Christianity, light as in shadow and light, there's an aspect of Christianity that doesn't really get a lot of airtime because it's not sexy. It's not loud voices. It's not people that are sort of foaming at the mouth and, and preaching hellfire and condemnation, which is what gets most of the airtime. But it's this idea of justice, and we, in, in theological circles, we call it social justice. And it's this idea that God's justice is also our justice, and that God's justice is to make things right on the earth. And that is about reducing poverty, increasing inclusion, honoring the beautiful diversity of humanity, of caring for the earth. And this is something that a lot of Christians are, are very involved in. The idea of social justice is, I think, not unique to Christianity, but it is fairly unique to Abrahamic religions. And Christianity has a tried and true expression of this. And so some, some examples of that could be people like Dorothy Day from the past who organized workers and worked for unions. She's the founder of the Catholic Workers Movement. She was completely motivated by her faith. It was her faith that enabled her, empowered her to do that. Or people like William Barber today, who has a spearheaded the Poor People's Campaign. And so this idea of human justice being part of God's justice, I think it does contribute to the collective unconscious and the collective consciousness, even when it's unconscious, even when people don't know about it. 
because these people have worked and been motivated by their spiritual experiences to make the world a better place. And so I think that's one aspect of Christianity that to me is was why I stay. Yeah, I, I like the way you frame that, Katie. I, I do want to be clear, though, on the difference between what you're calling God's justice and judgment, though. Can you expand on that a bit for us? I think mostly we see people's judgment. I'm not sure that we see what we perceive as God's judgment. We see a lot of people labeling their judgment as God's judgment based on a very sort of narrow interpretation of, of scripture and of experience. But my understanding of how God has expressed themselves over the millennia is of one who is always working towards the betterment of humanity. And that means more inclusion and honoring each individual and each collective culture to be exactly who they are. And to me, that is the justice of God. I see people's judgment often claiming that it's a judgment of God is actually not reflecting the God that I know. Thanks. That makes that really clear for me. That, that was really helpful to understand what you meant by that. And one thing that's always stood out to me about your work is that you seem to embrace faiths other than Christianity. I've just always really admired that about you. And to me, that's a characteristic of expanded consciousness. So what do you think was the major catalyst or maybe multiple catalysts that allowed you to have that kind of expanded awareness and inclusion and appreciation for all faiths, not just yours? I'm a naturally curious person. So I think part of it is just inborn in who I am. And also those really early experiences of seeing kind of evangelical, Catholic, mainline Protestant all put together at one, although they're all Christian, I saw that there were many ways to to be Christian and they didn't always all agree with each other. So I think that for me, that naturally expanded to other religions. And I have a distinct memory and I think I was in probably high school, middle school or high school, I was helping out with our vacation Bible school. And there was a field trip to a local synagogue, to a Jewish synagogue. There's not a huge community, but the kids, because they were kids, thought we were going back in time. They thought we were going back in time to see Jesus in a synagogue, or like two of the kids did. They were like, oh, oh my gosh, are we going to see Jesus today? No, honey, we're going, we're going to see modern Jews. There's modern Jews. And so we kind of had this awareness that like the Protestant kids didn't know that Jews were still a religion and still a people. And that just that little memory has kind of stuck with me over the years. And when you study the New Testament as seriously as I have, you can't study the New Testament without studying other ancient religions. You just can't. You have to understand ancient Greek religion. You have to understand something about ancient Roman religion. You have to understand something about Near Eastern religions of which Judaism was embedded. And that gave me an appreciation for how ancient religions were seeking to understand the divine around them. And so Christians exist in these small pockets among ancient pagan religions. And so when you think about a tiny community of, let's say, maybe 20 or 30 people surrounded by a culture that is very, very different, you have to understand that culture to understand why they're doing the things they're doing and why they're writing the things they're writing and what was required of them to shift from being a pagan to being a Christian. Like, why are they doing that? And so that question of why would someone make that choice is endlessly intriguing to me, endlessly intriguing. And then I find out that a lot of ancient pagan small groups looked a lot like ancient Christian groups. They had requirements for dress. They had sexual renunciation requirements. They were very careful about what they ate. That looks a lot like our early Christian monasticism. And so, you know, you see that these worlds, it's not that there's no differences. There obviously are. But there's a lot of similarities among them, too. So this idea of Christian exceptionalism is just silly. It's just silly. Christians were one group embedded within an ancient context. I think it's helpful to understand that ancient context. Oh, I think that's a really fantastic answer. And to go a little further, since we're speaking of ancient influences, I interviewed you once and you mentioned beliefs that had been passed down to us collectively. Things like zero-sum competition, lack, haves and have-nots, things like that. And it really stood out to me because Honestly, I don't see things that way. I see so much evidence to the contrary, like our world is not inherently competitive. It actually functions much more naturally and abundantly in cooperation rather than competition. But those beliefs are really so deeply embedded and pervasive. Can you expand on that a bit from your perspective? 
yeah, Roman, ancient Roman culture, it's not only the Romans, but the Romans inherited it, is this idea of like zero sum. So if I don't have honor, or not as much as I want, but someone else does, in order for me to gain it, someone else has to lose it. So we have this idea that there's always a competition, there's a finite amount of virtue in the world, and it has to be dispersed, taken, stolen, given accordingly. So I think we've inherited just a lot of that in our culture today. We've certainly inherited that around the idea of money and around abundance, that there's a there's a finite amount. And so then where that where that leaves a lot of people is they feel like if they get more money, they're taking it from someone and then they feel guilty and they feel really bad. So certainly there's jerks out there that do that. I'm, I'm not advocating for that. I don't like to work with those people. But if we can also see abundance as an infinite supply, that requires a really, really big mindset shift. And in my estimation, part of Jesus' message was to come and say, hey, there's enough for everyone. Like God's abundance is limitless. So I see the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 as a radical act of hope whether you take it literally or not, and that there is enough food to go around. That, that's a critical message for today. We have people who don't have enough to eat, and it's not because we don't have enough food to feed them. There is enough food in the world to feed every single person every single day. That's true. That's very true. It's the dispersion of that food is unequal. So like, do we need Jesus' message today more than ever? Absolutely. And it's not that I think Jesus is the only one saying that. Jesus is one among many who is saying that. I think that if we were to take those authentic messages of Jesus really seriously, we would absolutely revolutionize the world around us. And we would absolutely reduce this idea of like God's wrath, like God's judgment, and we would live instead into God's justice. And to me, that's what it's really all about. In my own journey, in my own scholarship, gender identity is a really important topic for me. And how can I in my life help trans inclusion in the world in a way that is life affirming for everyone? And that's a, a radical sharing of the abundance and the limitlessness that is all around us. We don't have to have these silly binaries of male and female. We can have a radical spectrum. We can honor that radical spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Those are big paradigm shifts. What would be your approach, Katie, to helping people make those big changes in their belief systems? The way I help people now with mindset shifts is through taking people on an inner journey and an inward journey and really, really holding safe space for them to be able to do that, which is a thing we don't have a lot of in our culture today, just people who will hold sacred, safe space, non-judgmental space for others. So if I'm working with someone, for instance, one-on-one -on -one, in order to do that, we might go on a shamanic journey or we might see what kind of allies are available to help people create more curiosity, to create more space in their lives. When, you know, when you're first doing it on your own, I think my best answer is to sit in silence, to be patient with yourself. Every time we come up with a disruptive thought to say, you know, is that actually true? Do I know that that's true? And to create the space for ourselves to think of it in a new way, right? Helps us get us outside of our box. And that's what allows us to think in new ways and create new neural pathways in our brains. Absolutely. I am a huge fan of pattern interruption. And, and the amazing changes and benefits that, that can come from that. I practice that regularly, although I do tend to jump off cliffs a lot. But small changes work, too. I, I guess I'm just impatient for change. Well, Katie, for someone who's not religious or spiritual, how would you recommend they go about expanding their consciousness? And why does it even matter? Is it all just airy-fairy nonsense? You can have someone who's a secular humanist or an atheist who's exceedingly closed minded and won't consider any new, you know, any new possibilities, just like you have a lot of religious people who do that. And then you have people who are really willing to expand uh, their worldview. And I think scientists do this exceedingly well, right? So scientists are always start with a presupposition and with a thesis, but then you are experimenting literally to try to prove yourself false so that you can expand knowledge and expand your consciousness. So I think my recommendation for the average person who doesn't have a microscope or like me can't do chemistry is simply to sit and wonder because there's so much wonder around us. And we can find that wonder in science, in nature, in your fellow human beings. And to me, it goes back to that opportunity to be curious. I taught in a small liberal arts college as an adjunct for a long time. And I had one student who was an atheist and he was a very kind, curious atheist. And he wrote such thoughtful essays about the Bible. 
And when I wrote an academic article, I said, I'd love to include some of the some of your quotes from your essays in that. And it'd been a year or two since I had taught him. And he just emailed back and said, oh, that's fine. And he said, why, why are you choosing me? I said, well, you, you really identified as an atheist and someone who was very thoughtful and was able to, I thought, really provided lovely interpretations of scripture. He said, oh, OK, I'm not an atheist anymore. I'm agnostic now. It wasn't like I had an agenda for him at all. I, you know, his journey is his journey. But he really showed me just in that short interaction in the, the two years or so that I knew him, he was open to wonder. He was open to thinking about things in a new way. I know I wasn't out to convert. I was simply out to provide biblical literacy in this class. But so many things can open our consciousness. So many experiences can do that. It makes me think a little bit of Darwin, whose wife had a huge problem with the discoveries that he was making. His wife was, was very concerned that he thought that God was not involved in, in evolution anymore. But he was astounded at the discoveries he was making with these different fossils. Like he expanded human consciousness very deeply by introducing us to this idea of evolution. So lots of experiences could be called spiritual. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I definitely understand that. And I've, I've experienced it both ways, in both directions. I was raised in a cult from about the age of seven. And uh, when I finally left in high school, I didn't have faith in anything. I used to say, I don't even have enough faith to be an atheist. I literally couldn't believe one way or another. I felt that it, it took just as much faith to definitively say there was a God as it did to say there wasn't, you know? Thanks for sharing that. And I'm not sure that certainty really serves us all that well. Certainly, a lot of ultra-religious people rely on certainty, but uh, I'll quote Anne Lamott here. Uh, um, she's a radical, kind of a radical, spiritual Christian writer. She says, the opposite of faith is certainty. To have faith means to be radically uncertain. It, it means to, to be very uncertain about what's coming next. It is to reside in that place of uneasy uncertainty and to find joy and peace within it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from your story, Melissa, coming out of a cult, there's so much trauma that's there. Mm -hmm. And anytime we've experienced trauma, we have to allow it to have its own breathing space before jumping into the next thing. Otherwise, we'll just re-traumatize ourselves. Yeah. Consciousness requires healing. Yeah. Uh, man, I really love that. Consciousness requires healing. Just let that sink in a minute because that, that's a lot of truth in just three words. And I really appreciate the reframe of faith, too, because uh, certainty can turn into rigidness and dogma, but faith requires openness and a willingness to embrace the unknown. I love the way you said that. Well, there's no denying that there's an explosive evolution of consciousness taking place worldwide, and with it seems to come an increased interest in spirituality, but maybe not so much religion. Do you agree with that, or, or what are you seeing as the future of religion? I don't know if I agree with it or not, because I'm not sure I agree with the premise. Because when someone asks me, are you spiritual or are you religious, they're making an assumption about me that's not fundamentally true. And the assumption is that if you're religious, you must be something that's usually like rigid, dogmatic, doctrinal, judgmental, etc. Well, that comes from a lot of good experience, right? Like the a lot of religious people have exhibited these characteristics of these traits. So it's become this weird, bad word now. But I'm an ordained Christian minister, so I don't know a way around that either. So it depends on what we mean when we say those words, like uh, when we say the words religious or when we say the words spiritual. I always find it a little humorous that I meet people all the time who say, there's no dichotomy, there's no binaries, there's unity, everything is one. You cannot be religious and spiritual. Uh, I find it really just hard to answer the question. But evolution of consciousness, I'm all about, and people call themselves spiritual but not religious. That's fine. I, I have no problem with that. But what is the future of religion? Well, this is where that kind of faith means being uncertain comes in really, really handy. I do believe that, at least in the United States and in North America, and in some degree in the Western world, this weird, damaging, toxic combination of nationalism and faith and capitalism are going to come to a crashing halt. When it does, when that happens, we're in late stages right now, I believe. When those fall, we will be left with people who we might call religious, who embody more of the authentic messages of their religion, especially in Abrahamic religions. I guess that's my hope. Maybe it's a naive hope, but that is my hope. So I think within Christianity, churches will be smaller, but more authentic. And I think we'll see smaller, a smaller group of people who are true community. 
So and within Christianity, we're in the middle of a second reformation now, and no one knows what that is going to turn into, le- least of all me. Yeah. I like that forecast. I like it. Very nice. And for you, what is the connection between energy, spirituality, and consciousness? So for me to be spiritual is to be attuned to the energetic and the unseen world around me. And I don't mean unseen only in terms of God, but also in terms of actual energy of the, the those beings that I call spiritual allies. And the more I am aware and attuned to that invisible reality, the more opportunity I have to grow in consciousness. So I work with a lot of people who think, if they can just find the right crystal or they can just identify their angel or meet a guide that all of their problems will be solved. All of that's going to create more problems if we're not growing in consciousness. And so for me, there has to be a chain reaction. And in order for us to expand spiritually, we have the opportunity to expand in our energetic awareness. And then we also have the uh, opportunity to expand in our consciousness. If you do one of those three without the other, they're going to be way, way, way out of balance. So I meet a lot of people who are, for instance, very attuned to energy, super attuned to energy. They can't discern any of it because they haven't grown in their consciousness and their their spirituality might be pre-programmed for fear. And so their their way accelerated in this like attunement to energy, but it's not actually benefiting them. In fact, it's probably harming them. That's a really good point. And so these three are tied together. We have to be, I think, conscious to all of them. And when I watch people maybe grow in their kind of spiritual journey, but then they don't get attuned to the energy, they might get overwhelmed with their spiritual journey, or it might turn only into a head exercise because they're not in tune with their heart. They're not in tune with the energy that's around them. So for me, they ideally will all grow together. And when one accelerates faster than the other, don't worry, you'll know it really, really quickly and be called back so that you can begin to work on the others. Oh, yes, ma'am. Called right back. Definitely. More words of wisdom from Katie. Well, to wrap this up, what is one thought that you'd like to leave listeners with that relates to the concept of exploring consciousness? You have to listen very deeply to your own soul, to your own spirit in this journey, because your soul and your spirit, whatever it is that you call that part of you that is eternal, is always having your best interest at heart. Always, always, always. So if your soul leads your way, your consciousness will expand. And that when our consciousness expands, we get to know more of the mind and the heart and the soul of God. And that kind of ultimate, the ultimate consciousness exploration will always lead us to the point of our journey that we need to be on. So let the soul go first and we can follow it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I love that. I am so grateful that you could join me today and for sharing your your gifts and your expertise and your stories. And where can people find out more about you and reach out to you? So the easiest way to find me is at soulforge.org, S-O-U-L-F-O-R-G-E coaching. And from there, you can find freebies and connect with me and see what's going on. And yeah, I would love to hear from everyone. Terrific. Thank you. And we'll have all that information in the show notes, of course. I've thought so much about my interview with Katie since we spoke. There was just so much to unpack, so I might really have to reel myself in on this one. But I want to at least touch on a few of the topics we discussed because they're so relevant to my own journey, but I also believe they're relevant to a lot of people's experiences. I have such an appreciation for Katie's openness. I love the way that her religion, along with her understanding and expansion of consciousness, just blend seamlessly together for her. I myself am not a Christian, but I've always been a huge fan of the teachings attributed to Jesus. They just made so much sense to me. But at the same time, Jesus' teachings seemed completely opposite from the God I'd read about in the Old Testament. From a young age, the God I learned about seemed like such a hot mess, really. Jealous, angry, lacking in grace and compassion, chaotic, violent, irrational, and totally inconsistent. It didn't make any sense to me why anyone would worship him. He didn't seem powerful to me at all. He seemed weak and insecure. And he certainly wasn't loving. Interestingly, these were the same characteristics and behaviors that the leaders of the cult I grew up in exhibited and justified, all in the name of this same God. They were very cruel and manipulative. And I learned the hard way that there really were only three commandments. You don't question, 
you don't complain, and you don't leave. I realize that not everyone grew up in an abusive cult, but I also believe that when it comes down to it, the experiences of many who grew up in traditional religions aren't really that far off from mine. The fear, control, and abuse of power exerted over the last 2,000 years didn't just disappear. It may be less obvious than it used to be, less brutal violence and torture, but it's no less harmful to our spiritual growth. I encourage anyone who is interested in expanding consciousness but is wary of religion to reach out to someone like Katie or me or any of the many people who can help you deconstruct harmful programming so you can find peace and harmony within yourself as the beautiful and eternal soul that you are. Get curious and don't be afraid to ask yourself about your own beliefs. I loved when Katie shared her perspective on the Adam and Eve story. It brought back so many memories of questions that I had when I was younger that I hadn't thought about in a long time. I never understood why gaining the knowledge of good and evil was demonized. It didn't make any sense to me. Didn't the acquisition of knowledge contribute to our ability to discern? Wasn't that a good thing? Having information? Why in the world would that damn humanity for all time? How could that cause us to be these pathetic, sinful creatures in need of saving? How could anyone look ever into the beauty and wonder of a newborn baby's eyes and still hold the belief that we are born flawed and sinful and unworthy? It seemed totally backwards to me. Still does. I don't believe it's our nature that is flawed. I believe it's our programming and the political, religious, and social systems that we've constructed and allowed as a result of that programming and choosing fear over love. I also really liked Katie's take on spirituality versus religion. I agree that it really depends on one's definitions as to whether or not they're the same or entirely different. I also agree that there are plenty of people whose spirituality includes dogma and exclusion. So again, knowledge and discernment are important for us to individually define these things for ourselves. For me, the words spirit and energy are synonymous, but the words religion and energy are not. So being spiritual for me is not something you acquire or practice or become. It's just something that you are by default. We can't not be energy. But religions are belief systems that we structured for various reasons, some helpful and some detrimental. Energy is something we don't know as much about as we think we do, but that's where curiosity comes in. Katie made so many references to her own innate and unquenchable curiosity, which I totally relate to. I believe that curiosity is literally divine, as in actually a quality of divinity itself. There should be nothing that we're afraid to be curious about, and nothing threatening about curiosity of any kind. It is the first and most important requirement for expanding consciousness. I left the cult in high school and moved out on my own. I wasn't curious for a long time because I had learned that curiosity wasn't safe. And while I didn't believe that it was of the devil, it was still some pretty deep programming. Eventually, I couldn't ignore it any longer. I dove into studying many different religions, including Buddhism, Hinduism, Catholicism, and various Protestant religions. I read books for and against religion, books exposing religious hypocrisy, and even some on mysticism. I studied cults, evangelical churches, and megachurches. It was incredibly cathartic, and I didn't feel so isolated in my experience. Later on in life, as I talked about in episode two, I read a book that my best friend gave me called The Shack. In that book, God is portrayed as a jovial, loving, and nurturing Black woman with a fabulous sense of humor. And that was incredibly freeing for me. And I'm so grateful to my bestie Denise for sharing that book with me because it gave me permission to hope that there might be something to believe in. And it set me off on a very slow but steady journey of finding that something. Eventually, I revisited Eastern religions. I remembered that there had seemed to be a really high resonance with the teachings of Jesus that had made so much sense to me in my youth. They also provided a deeper context and understanding of God as the source of consciousness. I began to understand that we don't have consciousness. We exist within consciousness. Much like the Bible verse in the New Testament, Acts 17, 28, that says, In him we live and move and have our being. For me, the hymn that that verse refers to is not a masculine tyrant, but the source of consciousness itself, unconditional and without preference for any religion or people, simply the energy source of all that is. Thank you for listening to Consciousness Explored. 
Consciousness Explored is part of the Mirror CFM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Once Upon a Business and Making It. A special thanks to Katie Valentine for generously sharing her time and perspective with us today. In the show notes, you'll find the link to her website, soulforgecoaching.org. If you'd like to reach out to me, I would love to hear from you. My contact information is in the show notes or just below on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss great episodes coming up on Consciousness Explored. Please follow us on Mira CFM's YouTube channel or your favorite podcast player. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a comment or a starred review. It really is the best way to help us get these ideas to more people. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.